Welcome to the wide world of esports, a show devoted to all things esports. I'm your host, Catherine Knorr. Today, our topic is the esports ecosystem. With me is Ben Bueno, founder and, and CEO of Agency Inc., the creators of Beacons GG. Welcome, Ben. Thanks for having me, Catherine. All right. So, what is Agency? I mean, at, at the core, we're a technology company, and basically, you know, we are here to create solutions for the kind of broader creator economy, and basically help people, you know, pursue their passion, and you know, give them the tools and opportunities to to pursue that passion, and uh, you know, so that they can kind of keep going for the, keep on the grind and uh, make money as they go. <laughs> so what? gave you the inspiration to start that company? Yeah, so I mean, a, a lifetime ago, I was a, a competitive gamer. Uh, I was really involved in uh, local gaming communities. I, I traveled and competed well before there was any money in, in traveling and competing, not to date myself. Uh, and, you know, for me, you know, being a part of these gaming communities was a huge uh, part of how, like, of myself, my identity. And, uh, you know, growing up, you know, over time, like seeing so much success in the esports ecosystem, I was like, man, like, like this is really cool. Uh, I I got the chance to, you know, I started my own, uh, you know, kind of local, you know, events organization company, running local events over some time. Then I got a chance to work at Riot Games. Uh, so I've been in and around in esports for a really, really long time. Uh, and then it wasn't, you know, my, my career took me in a different direction over the last, you know, 10 years. Uh, but I, you know, I, I really saw that the, there was a, something missing in the esports ecosystem. And this was kind of like the, the middle ground of, you know, the esports uh, space where like, there's so many people doing so many amazing things, building these amazing communities that I used to be a, you know, a big part of. Uh, and then there's this kind of like, you know, professional esports space that's, you know, your, your international, your Louis Vuittons are getting in, you have everything there. And it's like, well, like what's happening in the middle? Like, why aren't there a lot of people that are finding success, uh, you know, being the like, you know, the, the regional tournament organizers and like, why isn't that their like full-time careers and why aren't more people finding this kind of success? And so that was really the, the thing that I saw that was like, man, I really want to, be, to solve this problem. Uh, and then, you know, I, I've been able to uh, learn, uh, you know, local SEO marketing skills through my, you know, my day job here working at, uh, you know, uh, startups here in Los Angeles. And I was like, you know what, I, I finally felt like I, I had a thing. I was like, I got to take the chance. I got to take what I've been doing and just bring it back to the esports space. You know, that's inspirational for people who do want to start their own business. But I know that the viewers are really going to have this one important question of you what games did you play when you were competing oh man so uh <laughs> i made the terrible mistake of being a smash brothers brawl player uh <laughs> huge smash brothers fan uh you know melee was like dominating uh all of my friends were very very i'm from canada so canadian region pretty strong uh and uh all of my friends were just very very good and I saw them and they were, you know, still practicing 10 hours a day. And I was like, man, I'm never going to, you know, be as good as those guys. And then Brawl was announced and I was in my early 20s. And I was like, this is the game. I'm finally going to be on equal footing. Like it's the new game. I'm going to do into it. So I, I just like doubled down. I, I imported the system from Japan so that I could get like that extra month, you know, of practice on everyone. And I, and I did the grind. Uh, it was super, super fun. Uh, I played Rod the Robot exclusively. Uh, I know it's dirty uh but um you know it was great and i became the strongest player in my city and then in the local region and then one of the main contenders in like the, the region and then i started traveling around um and then the game just wasn't the most fun <laughs> and so no one plays it anymore <laughs> you know and that's what the problem is sometimes in esports you might pick the wrong game or you're like too early or too late or you know, something like that, or your life gets in the way, right? Yeah, it's and it's crazy. I mean, back then it was just, you know, like I obviously I invested a lot of my own personal time into it, where it was like uh, it was a passion project for me. Like I wasn't in it for the money, but you know, these days it's something that everyone needs to be really, really aware of when they're getting into esports. Is like, you know, if you are going to spend the tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars, you know, to start a team, it's like, well, which games you play is really important because the game might not be there in a year. And all of a sudden, all of that work is not there. So it's it's definitely something to think about. Yeah, and uh, so 
Let's move on to Beacons GG. What is that and why did you start that? Yeah, so Beacons GG is basically our first product, right? Um, you know, we're, we're a technology company, we build stuff. So we decided to call the first thing Beacons because we wanted everyone to be a beacon. Um, and basically uh, what we do is we take uh, event information. So like if you're already using something like Smash GG, Tournament, Challenge, Battlefy, you know, there, there's like like dozens of very, very good tournament organization pieces of software out there and they're all awesome. And we are not trying to rebuild any of those things. Basically what we are is we're like, an, like a website that takes that information and basically makes uh, an SEO optimized uh, website for local uh, events. So basically, if someone is on Google and being like, hey, I want to find a Smash Brothers tournament near me, or I want to find a Street Fighter or League of Legends, something happening in a certain area, like you should show up because you are creating an experience in that area. And hopefully people will find you and, and choose to sign up. And so that's that's what we do right now. And so how does how do you fit into the esports ecosystem yeah so like again so we're not really an esports company we're like a technology company a technology and advertising marketing automation that kind of stuff is how i describe ourselves but really like our goal is you know to really help people grow and we also really we want to make sure that we're not um we're helping people grow in a way that they can't get elsewhere, right? I think that there, you know, th this idea of like local SEO is something that like no one else is really trying to do. So it's like, yeah, this is something we can add. And like by us helping people grow, like the whole ecosystem is growing and everyone's growing together. We're not, we really are, are not trying to come and be like, oh, we're gonna just redo what those guys do, but a little bit better and take their market share. Like, I don't know, that's that's not like our, our mission. Our mission is to like, you know, really grow the entire thing and, you know, make that middle class kind of become uh, a stable ecosystem. Sure. And so uh, how is eSports used as a marketing and engagement channel for game publishers? Yeah, so eSports has gotten under like a ton of growth recently, right? And like, you know, when I was doing it, it was really small. And now you look at it, it's, it's kind of like everywhere. Uh, and I think it's really important to, to kind of see it in the context of like, uh, the game publishers that rely on esports for uh, engaging their players long term, and this is kind of like a, a this has come about because their business model has shifted from the like one time purchase box, you know, you go to the store, spend sixty bucks, you, you buy it, to the microtransactions, the loot boxes that everyone hates, the battle passes, uh, and like the the longer term monetization, and so as their business model shifted from like an upfront purchase to like lifetime value, like, okay, well, how do we keep players engaged for a month, a year, 10 years? And so esports is that way for them to, to keep people engaged. There's like the seasonal drop content drops. And so that keeps people playing their game for longer and longer. So like they make more money. Uh, and it's just like, that's really like why, you know, the, the game publishers really pushed Esports really, really hard, and they were dumping so much funds and in, like into creating it because they're like, well, this is how we're going to do it. And I think for me, um, you know, the the biggest thing today that kind of like proves this to me, um, outside of you know my my direct experience in the industry, is uh, like Fortnite tried to do this right, where they like we're going to do an esports, we're going to have like millions of dollars of uh, tournaments, and then it didn't really happen because like their game didn't really like turn into an esport, right? It wasn't meant to be like the experience wasn't that competitive kind of thing. And so I, I was really impressed that they were able to pivot into these like the virtual experiences and the concerts and everything. And you know, turning it into that kind of like metaverse, you know, it was their version of like, well, we can't do esports. Well, let's try something else to like keep our players engaged. And so I think that, you know, those these things are should be considered, you know, different tactics to keep uh, players engaged long term. Sure. And you know what? I really can't talk about the esports ecosystem unless I talk about something that has just happened. The okay. Olympic Games. Okay. So we just had the Olympic Games. And so do you have any thoughts on uh, esports being uh, an Olympic part of the real Olympic Games and not just like a, a, a side event? Yeah. 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 It, it's interesting. I. <sighs> To me, East, like the esports is like a word that gets thrown around a lot, but there to me there really is no esports. Like each game that gets played is its own competitive ecosystem. It's it's kind of like you know, say like 
are there going to be sports in the in in the, the Olympics, right? It's like, well, of course there's going to be sports, right? But like, which sports are going to be in there, right? Is it League of Legends? Is it Overwatch? Is it, you know, Rocket League? Is it, you know, Crossfire? Is it all these games that like North America has very little, you know, invested interest in, right? Like, and you, you run into that kind of as well. So um, I think there's a long road ahead of the gaming industry to get a an esport into the olympics officially uh and i think there's a lot of like obviously ip issues and monetary things but uh also i think that question really has to be resolved first before you know any any major steps happen yeah and you know what's interesting is we've just seen um uh skateboarding uh surfing uh competitive uh or or actually speed climbing right uh, we We've seen those that addition of those events. So it's kind of like saying, I, I like how you equated it esports to sports in that. And and you know, so it would be more like it would be more correct to say now we're gonna have Rocket League. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Rather than have esports. Yeah. And like and honestly, that's like the toughest thing for from the Olympics, I guess, point of view is like, well, which ones do you add, right? Well, which ones are the most popular? Which ones have the best viewing experiences? Which ones, you know, to, to get more people to watch and care about the Olympics kind of thing. Uh the the weird, unique kind of thing that esports has is like there's that person that own there's that entity that owns the football game, right? Like with football, no one makes money every time you go out into your backyard and plays football. But like really, again, like, you know. You know, Riot Games owns League of Legends, Blizzard owns Overwatch. And so like there's a lot more, you know, uh, considerations when you're trying to involve that in another event like the Olympics. Sure. And OK, so then when, you, when you're talking about like publishers yeah. and, and players and everything. So what is the power dynamic between players, teams? league and publishers yeah i think it's super interesting because like the publishers are kind of like the wild card in the esports e ecosystem where um you, you kind of it's like you have individual players right they're the people who play the game you know they're they're in it to be famous like it takes a lot of time and effort to be a professional player and like they they genuinely want to be the best right and it's like well you know teams are there to kind of provide uh you know support to those players and it's like, hey, like join us, you know, we're you're gonna have like health benefits, you're gonna have a salary, it's gonna be consistent, you can focus on you know honing your craft. And then it, but then there's also like, oh, also look at all these other cool people we have. You'll have a good like if it is a team game, it's like you have a good chance of winning and being recognized as the best if you join us. Um, and then leagues are a really interesting spot where it's like, well, if you win our league, you will be recognized, right? So they're all like creating frameworks to help each other succeed. And so it's a very interdependent relationship between the three. Um, and then you have the publishers that are like, well, we just own the whole thing. This is our, this is our game. Uh, and so, you know, you have the leagues that are trying to, to, you know, create a brand. And then you have the teams that are creating brands and you have individual players that are creating brands. And it's like between the three of them, it's like, which one brings the most value to the table? And it's like, you know, if you're like a superstar individual player, like you, you're not going to give a lot to a team that you join because like you're bringing the, you know, like you're worth more, right? But the same with the teams, right? Like if you have like a superstar team brand, it's like just just the idea of you competing in a league is like, oh, it like elevates that, you know, minor league up to fame status, right? Or vice versa, if you can establish yourself as the destination of a league, you know, this is where you go to prove yourself, then you kind of hold the power. So it's very interesting push and play where they're all trying to uh, compete for that brand recognition uh, but they're all required to be working together for any one of them to succeed. So they're they're kind of at odds with each other. They're kind of working together. Uh, and then they're, and then the game publishers are like, well, you know, this is our IP. We spent you know a lot of money developing this IP. Uh, this is our game. And like you know, I, my personal kind of opinion is like the like any league that truly becomes profitable or like like under the guise of like we are the destination for you know x game uh and then the publisher like once that's like a, a profitable business the publisher will definitely be like well no like we own anything that's the you know the collegiate x for this game like that's ours because this is our ip and and it's, it's ours you can operate it if you want and we'll we'll contract it out to you but like they're definitely going to bring that kind of stuff in house long term Sure. 
So is there an art to creating value like as a sponsor with a creator community? Yeah, I think this is something that like, um, I remember I was at the uh, Sports Business Journal Esports Rising Conference. Um, I personally really like that one because it's like from the sports side. And so you see right. like, a really different perspective uh, coming in. Um, and like there was a brand, uh, I forget which one it was that was talking and they were like, oh, you know, um, people think that as a creator, if you take like a bad uh, sponsorship, then uh, they have uh, all the risk, right? And that the, the creator is going to kind of like their reputation is going to go down. But really, it's kind of the opposite. Like if you're like a major brand and uh, like you're using influencer marketing and you're trying to reach your audience and you you do work with someone that doesn't isn't aligned with your brand and that gets out there like the the major advertisers actually have way more on the line than individual creators out, out there so it's a really interesting kind of dynamic there and then um especially when you go down to like the micro nano influencers and everything like understanding how to work with them to create value is is very difficult right like um my, my favorite example so we're, we're sponsoring a bunch of like local organizations just to you know work with people and like we we do believe that there's there and with the end goal of like we're also gonna be helping organizers find other sponsors as well uh and it's like you know you, you can't just go find a tournament with like you know four or five people in it and be like here's a 100 bucks right like doesn't make you're not going to add a hundred dollar prize pool to like a five five person tournament right like it doesn't make sense and uh you know one of the most interesting examples of this at scale i think was like the valorant launch uh which i think you know riot games did a really really good job of you know using the influencer marketing influencers and like the twitch drops to like get the word out i i truly believe that like the ability to just like overnight everyone knew what the game was everyone understood like exactly what that game was going to be and when they bought it they they got what they expected i was like i was like great but what ended up happening is they left the drops on for so long that like the community started getting flooded with bots and like thousands and thousands of these just like people that were like the value of watching like normally when you're watching a content creator you're like oh i'm gonna be part of the community this is gonna be fun but like during that period of time like the the prize was so big of like the, the beta access key that you had just people sitting there you know doing nothing and you know the all of a sudden the community changed and like it wasn't the same community as it was like a week before and you know all of the, you had a uh, summit 1g it was someone that i was watching through that time and he was very vocal about his like you know he hated having to stream he was like i have to stream this game it doesn't matter if i like it or not if i don't stream this game right now no one's going to be watching me and right like my chat is just full of bots doing nothing or people spamming like i can't really interact with my community the way that i wanted it and it was a very negative experience for for his community. Now, clearly, he had like a, a huge boost of numbers. Uh, and I'll admit that I haven't really followed up to see like did it like permanently boost his numbers and everything. But I thought it was a really interesting, you know, way of look, like you have to be careful about like you know like the reason influencers and creators are valuable is because their community is engaged. And as soon as like if you if you add too much, then that's lost, and then you're you're probably not going to get your money's worth out of that. <laughs> Yeah, you know, and I think it's interesting that Valorant was released recently. And I think with each new release of a big title, I think we're going to see some new things and learn more. Yeah. So what do you think are uh, the big trends in esports? Oh, man, there, there's a lot. Um, I mean, trends in, in, in what area? <laughs> um, I don't know. Let's talk about uh, big leagues. Big leagues. Okay. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I think I'm, I, my biggest thought in the big leagues is that like, um, leagues are, are going to need to find a way to create their own value. Uh, I see a lot of leagues out there being like, we're trying to be the NCAA. We're trying to be collegiate. We're trying, we're, we, we are this space or, you know, we are the destination. And I'm like, as I said before, like publisher, like if you are the destination for something, the publisher is going to own it. Right. So, you know, like outside of being the place for this, like what value can you create? Right. I think there's a lot of um, kind of like regional um, collegiate communities. I'll call them communities. I have to admit, I'm not a part of this community, but like they, uh, they do a really good job of saying like, okay, like here's like a, here's a group of colleges, they create their own league um, and they, they like 
encourage participation. These aren't like national brands, but like the students care because, you know, it's not like their team is playing against someone across the country or in a, a different country because Canada North and the US are the same, but like they care because it's the school down the street, right? And like it creates that, you know, that rivalry and like they get more, pe more people are actually watching those experiences, more people are engaged with it. And so like as a, you know, I think there's a lot of value in those like, you know, smaller regional things. Like they're like, we're not trying to be the place. We're just trying to provide a place where this group of colleges can compete, have some fun, you know, have some cool stories. And, you know, because they're creating value, I do know of one up in my hometown near Ottawa, uh, where like now they're getting they're they are getting sponsors and like the winners are getting scholarships and like they're they're not even trying to be a national thing but like they are creating enough value where they can now offer that to the, the winners. So what about uh, trends in traditional sports and esports? Yeah, it, it's really like, all right, uh, a lot of traditional sports maps onto esports very, very directly. And like, that's on purpose, right? Like, you know, sports are, are valuable. It's a, it's a good model. I'm, I'm very happy that esports, you know, uh, matches it very closely. Uh, I think that like, Today, we're seeing like a lot of investment into um, like arenas uh, and those type of like physical location to, to mimic that next generation of mimicking sports. Um, there's a lot of like sports betting is like a huge thing. Uh, and I mean, for me and my focus, there's a lot of like uh, fan engagement is like the, a very, very big focus right now. Uh, obviously, you know, if you have fans, the engagement, the monetization. Um, and I think that um, there's a, one of the things that I think doesn't necessarily map directly um, is like in arena fan engagement experiences. Um, and, and, and I know this is kind of like awkward or just in general, like fan engagement apps. Uh, I think that the, the nature, like when, when you're watching an esports event, um, there's no commercial break. Right, like the the commercial break is in between games, uh, whereas traditional sports you have like okay, well you know it's commercial break, so we're gonna play the the song one more time. It's gonna be kind of an extra long break in between these plays, and you know it's kind of like woven into the the actual game at this point. Uh, and so it's just like you know in traditional sports you have like that start stop start stop you know kind of happening very frequently. Um, and so like the the type of you know X like the game on top of the game kind of thing you know, that needs to fit into those little moments, like throughout, you know, a lot of little moments throughout the, the, the game. Whereas with esports, it's like, well, you're, everyone's watching the game and then the game's over. And then there's like a pretty large break in between, like the, the intermission in between games is very long and, and kind of condensed. And so I think that like, if you try and map that type of engagement one-to-one, -one, I, I don't think it's going to land very hard. And I think you have to really try like, this is an esports event, you know, here is an engagement for this event. So I have, you know, so that leads me to believe that, okay, so if you're looking at, like we talked about the Olympics earlier, if you look at the Olympics or you look at the Super Bowl, okay, those are sponsorship events. They're sponsorship events and security events as much as they are traditional sporting events, okay? Totally. So then it leads me to believe that potentially in the future that a publisher will uh, create a title that can be uh, broken up in ways that sponsors can provide, you know, uh, their messages. What do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, the in-game monetization and like advertising is something like super interesting. I know, obviously, like you know, League of Legends tends to lead the way with uh, like the banners in the game and like the the in-game advertising, like super interesting. Um, I think it's gonna be a uh, a little bit. It's gonna, be, it's gonna be very difficult for uh, an esport to truly mimic that that cadence. I think mm -hmm. because like as a game designer, making a game that is like fun to play but also fun to watch is already hard enough. Like those are two very different things, and it's it, you know they're both individually very very hard to do. And now when you add a third one onto it, it's like oh, also it has to have this kind of cadence and this flow so that we can put commercial breaks in is like crazy. I think uh, you know game de game developers already need to kind of like design around a monetization strategy it's like oh like th like this is how we're going to be making money and that's like baked into the experience uh and you have to kind of design around it and i think that's one of the reasons why like 
a lot of the games fall flat and it feels like the monetization is tacked on because it kind of is the really good ones are like they're the whole game is really designed around making it feel fair and make people want to actually do that kind of stuff uh and so just adding on one more thing on top of that i think is just going to break their minds <laughs> Yeah. Okay. So I really want to make sure we get to Beacons GG. So mm -hmm. what, is, what is your goal? And uh, tell us about what you're doing in there. Yeah. So again, the, our goal, we really just want to help people pursue their passion. We just want to build technology that other people can use to find their version of success, right? Like not everyone's trying to be the next, you know, massive, you know, superstar. Some people just want to be uh, the people that support their communities, right? So whatever you're trying to do, we're here to support you. Uh, we're, we we have our beta product out. Uh, basically, you know, it's this SEO optimized events website. Um, you know, we're looking for anyone who runs a esports event in an area. We want to talk with you. Uh, and we just want to work with you. And we want you to tell us, you know, we want to build this product with you, right? There's a lot of different things we could build. We want to make sure we're building the right thing. So we want people that uh, want to both use it, test it, give us feedback and help us uh, build the products. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, the things that are like after this, I think I alluded to it, we're, we're doing some like marketing automations to make it easier for you to promote your events. We're doing some analytics so that you can kind of, uh, a lot of what we do is, is around, um, you know, we, we are very into the advertising and sponsorship space. So you know, making sure that we we can automatically kind of package everything that you're doing and present it to potential advertisers and sponsors in a way that they kind of understand it and they feel good about it. Uh, you know, not everyone knows how to do that today. So uh, those are the things that we're focused on next. And we're really excited to work with a lot of really passionate people. So if someone wants to reach out to you, how do they contact you? So you can just go to beacons.gg slash sign up. Um, uh, you can also email me directly at ben at beacons.gg and uh, I'll, I'll get you going. And I know that a question that the viewers will have before we wrap up is what's your dog's name? Because your dog is, <laughs> is with you in. <laughs> um, no, that's is, important. Yes, this is Atlas. Uh, he's four years old. Uh, we thought he was going to be a pit mix at around 30, 40 pounds. He's a Husky and he's a hundred pounds and he just loves hanging out there. <laughs> oh, fantastic. Well, thank you, Ben. I really appreciate all of the information you pro provided us today. Thanks for having me. It's been great chatting. All right. Terrific. And uh, thank you to our viewers for joining us today. Next week, my guests will be uh, Gerald Solomon and Kevin Brown of the North America Scholastics Esports Federation. See you then.